And so begins the seemingly endless minion assault that we are destined to endure until the end of time. Has anyone who put the Great Pyramids of Giza in a film ever Googled where the pyramids actually are? Because, spoiler alert, they are semi-surrounded by large metropolitan cities called Giza and Cairo. Quick, honey, take my picture! American tourists are fat and stupid and southern and fat cliché. No, stop it! Despite being ordered to stop by multiple authority figures, this asshole kid continues to asshole assholely. So if this pyramid never popped, no one would ever know that one of the Great Pyramids was missing, making the time spent to steal the pyramid completely useless. Isn't the whole point of stealing this giant monument to show people how powerful you are, or to ask for a ransom to return it, or something? If no one knows that it's gone, then what's the f***ing point? Why did the pyramid deflate? The kid just bounced off it without puncturing it at all. And it's been there for a presumably long time. The Great Pyramid of Giza had been stolen and replaced by a giant inflatable replica. Not only did nobody see the inflatable pyramid go up, it was apparently done with a hand pump by one dude. There's panic throughout the globe as countries and citizens try to protect their beloved landmarks. Movie decides to depict two real monuments of other countries, but makes up a fake hillbilly monument for America. Yeah, this really shows what a f**kwad Gru is in the beginning, but I'm more concerned that this kid is hanging out unsupervised in the middle of town while a grown man gives him a treat from his pocket. Gru just takes that cup of whatever from the barista, when everyone knows how hyper-specific coffee orders are. So he'll regret not waiting in line when he's sipping his grande vanilla bean creme frappuccino served in a venti cup with almond milk, extra caramel drizzle, coconut flakes, Greek yogurt, protein powder, and three Splendas. Oh, despicable me. Holy sh a roll credits moment in the first five minutes. Even Suicide Squad held out until the middle of the movie. This quiet residential road has three enormous lanes to accommodate the sight gag. Also, I guess since there are no real consequences for being a supervillain in this universe, Gru has no reason to be inconspicuous. One of Gru's many villainous deeds, violating his HOA agreement. Also, you know why supervillains usually live on a mountain or on an island? Serene seclusion, beautiful vistas, but mostly it's harder to get caught. But Gru lives in this planned community, surrounded by other people, and continues to live his day-to-day -day life without anyone questioning his profession. Gru has a garage that appears to be built specifically for this automobile, but parks it on the driveway instead. I guess he keeps his treadmill and in there? This door has its mail slot on the very bottom, which makes it a dick to mail people. Gru! Ah, Dr. Lefario! Gru has a video chat camera that accepts calls by itself, allowing Gru to be inevitably caught in an awkward situation in his living room. Assemble the minions! Who is Gru talking to here? Is he asking Dr. Nefario to assemble them so they can be there before he gets to the lab? Because then he also tells the minions personally... Minions assemble! Why the two orders, Gru? Why the two orders? Why does Gru need this hilariously complicated Rube Goldberg transportation device? It's not because he's trying to keep it secret, since the method of entry is hitting one obvious button on the chair. Bumbling group of mutants are somehow capable of building and maintaining this giant lab. Jesus, Gru's corporation has some excellent benefits. How has he not gone public yet? Even in the world of animated bullshit, this perspective is nonsensical. Gru lives in a heavily residential area and went straight down in his entry tube for a matter of seconds. But movie wants me to believe he's hollowed out a bat cave sized lair to house his evil doing. We stole the Times Square Jumbotron! Um, where is camera? The Jumbotron is showing a direct perspective of Gru here, but there's no filming equipment in sight. We stole the Statue of Liberty! The small one from Las Vegas! <laughs> Minions, many of which were presumably in on the heist to steal the smaller Statue of Liberty, are disappointed to learn what they should already know. How tall are Minions? Like, two feet tall? The Statue of Liberty outside New York, New York in Las Vegas is 15 f***ing feet tall. But these Minions almost come up to the top of the pedestal. My point is, f*** this movie's size perspective. I haven't told you what it is yet! Premature rocket launch elation. Going to steal the moon! Isn't this lab underground? Like, way the f*** underground? Also, when Gru got home, it was the middle of the day. Christ, it's like this movie isn't even trying to movie. Seems like the only people that are walking around on the streets of this city are unsupervised children. Is this The Outsiders? Anybody come to adopt us while we were out? Let me think. No. Movie perpetuates the myth that all orphanages are terrible and the women who run them are evil. Honestly, this is the real villainous behavior. Most normal people wouldn't give a sh** about a guy stealing tourist attractions from around the world, but I can guarantee you they'd care about some Mike Wazowski-shaped asshole destroying their car. Does this urinal read everyone's eye that uses it? Even if the door doesn't open unless you're a villain, I guess there will be a red laser shooting into your retinas while you pee. Gru reacts to the man sculptures on these columns like this is the first time he's seeing them, even though earlier he says, I'll just get another loan from the bank. They love me! Implying that he has been there many times before. Also, is there really a network of villains this large to support a bank that can support a facility like this? Or is there still a Lehman Brothers division of the Bank of Evil that's still up and running, partially funding this operation? Why does a receptionist need two computer screens, especially ones this far apart? Mom, someday I'm going to go to the moon. Oh, 
I'm afraid you're too late, son. NASA isn't sending the monkeys anymore. Damn, Gru's mom is savage. I'm surprised he's just an innocuous supervillain that steals large, insured objects and not a mass murderer. I'd like to see this shrink ray. The director said, let's have your bank loan officer character eat an apple in this scene. It'll make him look like an even bigger bank loan officer. You don't have it, and yet you have the audacity to ask the bank for money. Gotta side with the asshole bank guy here. Why the hell wouldn't Gru steal the shrink ray before applying for the loan? Do you have any idea of the capital that this bank has invested in you, Crew? With far too few of your sinister plots actually turning a profit. Let's talk about that for a second. Based on what we've seen so far, it doesn't appear that any of these villains are holding the items they steal for ransom, nor do they have any intention of selling them on some international monument black market. So how the f*** are the villains or the evil bank making any of their money back? Are they licensing these stories of their heist to DreamWorks to make weird half-baked animated films out of? Gru's secret plane is probably the worst secret plane to ever secret, considering the massive line of black smoke coming out its back end. The scientists just happen to be testing out their super secret shrink ray right before Gru and his crew make it to the facility. Also, why are these guys so scared and relieved by this test? Haven't they done this before? The shrink ray's technology has been around for long enough for Gru to hear about it and make a plan to steal it, so they should have done many of these trials. Gru somehow knows the exact location of this shrink ray and is able to drill through the ceiling, grab it, and escape with absolutely no difficulty at all. Almost as if the movie wanted to push through this part so it can spend its energy on the montage of Gru and the three little girls at the amusement park. We got it! Why wouldn't Gru have taken more than two minions with him on this highly perilous trip overseas? I mean, sure, they got the shrink ray without a problem, but maybe a well-trained horde could ensure they kept it for more than 30 seconds. No, 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 no! Gru continues to fly perfectly straight while his prized possession is stolen in front of him. Gru releases all of his bombs and missiles at once instead of conserving them as the fight continues. And even if they were effective, he'd have destroyed the f***ing shrink ray. Vector's playing the Wii, but there's no motion sensor bar on this TV. And anyway, the whole point of the Wii was to get the players standing up instead of sitting on the couch eating f***ing potato chips, so Vector's doing this Wii all wrong. Gru, who is also supposed to be a world-class supervillain, is seemingly unable to anticipate the security measures Vector may have on his property. Gru survives this. And this! Look, are we just gonna go full Wily e. Coyote here? Because I'm already suspending my disbelief so hard my back is hurting. How big is this town anyway? Not only are the two most wanted international villains located within what looks like a mile from each other, the f***ing orphanage is nearby. And I see you have been given the Medal of Honor. Miss Hattie sees these things appear in real time on her screen, but apparently just learned how to use a computer, so it doesn't surprise her. Can we proceed with this adoption? Please tell Margot, Edith, and Agnes to come to the lobby. Wait, how did Gru know what the girls' names were to even get on the adoption list? He could be adopting any of these girls. Booyah! The scene is further proof that this may be the worst villain who has ever existed. Instead of using his new shrinking power to roll out a reign of villainous behavior, or shrinking that giant pyramid he obviously has, Vector inconveniences himself by shrinking the appliances in his bathroom. When we got adopted by a bald guy, I thought this would be more like Annie. Well, it kinda is. Aside from the large weaponry that's being obviously displayed, the story's pretty similar. Wealthy bachelor adopts a girl from an abusive orphanage for selfish reasons, doesn't like her, then warms over time. The only thing that's missing is yet another cover of Hard Knock Life. No. Stay away from there, it's fragile! <gasps> well, I suppose the plan will work with two. Sure, Gru's a villain and all, but does his villainy typically involve f***ing child murder? He's incredibly casual about this. It's dark in here! Movie continues to be a big old f***ing cheat when it comes to perspective, considering those spikes were way too long to miss impaling Edith. As you can see, I have provided everything a child might need. Why is Gru even keeping up this subterfuge, even for a night? All he needs them for is to get into Vector's mansion, so why not go there as soon as they're adopted? What about the heir? This kind of backtalk would have easily put Margot in the box of shame back at the orphanage. And since this sassy retort gets basically no reaction from Gru, I would submit that Miss Hattie is more evil than either Gru or Vector. I will see you in six hours. Okay. Don't worry. Everything's going to be fine. Why does she even need to reassure them? I know they'd probably prefer a loving household, but all three of them were adopted at the same time, and they're basically free now. I'm convinced that at least 72% of minion humor is ass-based. What are these? A dozen boogie robots! I know this is a comical misunderstanding, but why did Dr. Nefario give all the boogie robots tiny boogie boobs? Master villain Gru, who plans every detail of his heists, leave three complete strangers unsecured to run amok in his house. Yeah, he's new with this whole child-rearing thing, but come the hell on! That is cool! Earlier, Gru timed his entrance to the tube very specifically, but now the door stays open long enough for the girls to get inside. And even if there were a weight trigger, there's no way these three girls weigh as much as a fully grown Gru. I meant to close that. But they're in a severely underground f***ing bunker. And now the minion is floating away into the nice neighborhood, but nobody's gonna notice? Does anything mean anything in this f***ing universe? What I really wanted to show you was this. Now those are cooking robots! 
This is the only thing that Gruz asked Nefario to work on, but he led this presentation with an anti-gravity juice and a silly fart gun. In real life, I am a spy. And it is top secret. Gru openly shoots people in crowded venues with a freeze ray and intimidatingly drives his enormous vehicle in regular traffic. That should be enough to call attention to the fact that he's a villain. But he also has f***ing newspaper clippings on the wall to tell everyone he's the best villain. So why the silly cover story here? What are those? They are my mm, cousins. Okay, so if the kids buy that a mutant one-eye pastel butt plug is an actual human, I guess anything goes in this movie. And I am completely uninterested in the stakes of the leads. Jeez, these minions are assholes. There's a perfectly good spot that you could even pull through right next to the handicap spot. <sighs> Minions go all the way to a Costco-like store just to get a toy, which means they'll definitely come back with a five-pack of toy unicorns, three jugs of milk, a flat screen, and a rack of ribs. 49 seconds of pure, uncut minionation. Hope you appreciated it when it was only that long. You're never gonna be my dad. What the hell? I mean, I know Margot's got some to work out from being an orphan, but after a rocky start, Gru hasn't been that bad. He didn't get too pissed when they broke into the lab. He tried to replace Agnes's toy immediately, let them have a teepee party, then provided a warm bed for each of them. She may want to pump the brakes on this whole angst thing until after he steals the f***ing moon. It's beautiful. These little bastards couldn't recognize a suitable stuffed animal at what was essentially Walmart, but were able to dress a toilet bowl brush to look like a toy. First, we're going to dance class. We have a big recital coming up. Come on, man, these are f***ing orphans. But they have a dance class they regularly attend. They were doing hard sales labor for their evil headmistress, but she ponied up for dance class for all three of them? You're going to suffer the wrath of Gru! Seriously, I'm going to count to three! Steve Carell's accent was briefly hijacked by Hans and Franz for this scene. Gru shows up to this highly secretive mission at Vector's place in his highly conspicuous Gru mobile. Name one person who ordered more cookies than me. That'll be $52. Holy Vector ordered 23 boxes, so even though these aren't technically Girl Scout cookies, that's $2.25 a box and is a fantastic deal. Not only are these sentient cookie robots able to track down the location of the shrink ray in a matter of seconds, they're able to hack into an evil genius's secret vault and security system with zero difficulty. Also, the keypad that opens this safe is also capable of shutting down the entire security system, because Vector's security system is working together with a screenwriter to create a situation that is most convenient to the plot. These cookies were also paid off by the screenwriter to seal Gru in Vector's fortress, forcing his escape to be more hijinxy. Protagonist approaches antagonist, scene then cuts to a single shot of antagonist looking in protagonist's direction, cuts back to where protagonist was, and he there gone, cliche. Vector conveniently has a ventilation system that has plenty of room for a man and his minions to properly die hard. <laughs> That's hilarious, but also unnecessary when you have a shiny glowy thing that could light your way right behind you. Casual vehicular homicide is casual. Also, this really does serve the dude right. Who the f*** would fish off a guardrail on a steep curve of a busy-ass highway? He looks pretty old. Maybe he was hoping for sweet death. Too bad he used his real name when he adopted the girls, right? If he'd used a fake name, he probably could have abandoned them easily without them showing up right back at his doorstep. Overreaction revenge shot would have definitely disintegrated the stuffed unicorn that was being coveted. You don't love me! Despite how annoying she can be, Agnes is freaking adorable. And for this moment alone, I'm having a Gru-like rush of affection. Quick, take one cent off before she does something else obnoxious. That was awesome. You blew up the whole thing! With no legal or societal consequences. This place is anarchy. Woohoo, mother We have 12 days until the moon is in optimum position. Movie that's played way fast and loose with physics, perspective, laws, biology, and humanity decides to throw in some bullshit sciencey stuff to create an arbitrary deadline. Can't afford any distractions! What's up Nefario's ass all of a sudden? He's the one that's been dicking around with the boob robots and fart guns, but all of a sudden there's a sense of urgency? You don't seem terribly focused, Gru. Why is Perkins even keeping up this appearance of a meeting? Shouldn't he be getting the location of the shrink ray and telling Vector about it immediately? What's the benefit of keeping him on the line? What is it? So, is he keeping his identity a secret or not? These kids just walk in every time Gru is talking about villainy, so pick a side, movie. The ever-flexible size of this underground bunker that's directly under a regular neighborhood can now hold a functional rocket ship, because the movie don't give a f about what you think you previously saw. like a dead guy. Movie will clobber you over the head to remind you that Gru's a psychopath. Even though now that he's listened to a Pharrell song, he's completely harmless. Hey, Dad. What the hell does it matter that Perkins is Vector's father? The only advantage this gives Vector is awareness that Gru stole the shrink ray and apparently an endless supply of apples. This is a screenshot of a moment that never happened in their previous video chat. During that chat, the only person who was ever present with the shrink ray was Gru. And the only girl who ever got in the way of the camera was Edith. Do you have any idea how lucrative this moon heist could be? Actually, no, because movie hasn't explained any motive for capturing it, other than being considered the best villain alive. So just wait till Gru sees my latest weapon. Squid Launcher! Oh yeah! Can someone explain to me how this jackass was able to steal one of the pyramids with only weapons that launch sea creatures? Oh, I don't like this book. 
This is going on forever. Late movie Gru would be excellent at CinemaSins. Hang on, if his last name is Gru, then why does Gru go by Gru? His first name is apparently felonious, but that's definitely not what it says here. Gru! You and I have been working on this for years! Your chance to make history! They've been working on this for years? Gru just went to ask the bank for a loan after Nefario told him they didn't have enough money. Then he steals the ray and builds the rocket within 12 days. So why did this take years? I'm here for the girls. I received a call that you wanted to return them. And in this universe, we treat children like that juicer you ordered on Amazon when you were drunk that time. Goodbye, Mr. Gru. Thanks for everything. <sighs> Protagonist begins movie as a cold-hearted bastard that lives a life of crime, then is forced into circumstances where he needs to care for another individual, but then the business of his previous life makes it impossible to care for that individual and they hate him for it before inevitably reconciling cliché. Not only is this apparently the first indication the neighborhoods had that there's a secret underground lair, but given the amount of rocket fire, Gru has definitely killed everyone in a 10-block radius. Oh yeah! This character is definitely Discount Syndrome, made even more annoying by giving him a stupid-ass catchphrase or two. Sure, minions can survive the cold vacuum of space, because they'll do whatever it takes for a cheap joke. We're clearly watching the minions watching a screener of the movie, because there's no way that is the video feed they are getting from Gru. Yeah, something like this would happen if the moon went away, but several other more devastating things might happen also. The Earth would start spinning faster, making days shorter, and the axis may dramatically tilt, causing extreme weather conditions. I could go on, but just know it'd be bad. But instead of Gru threatening to do this, showing how much he could do it, demanding money so he doesn't do it, he decides to steal the moon, ask for no money, watch Earth fall apart while everyone wonders who stole the moon. I guess Gru's only driving factor is to prove to himself and his mother that he can steal very big things and he doesn't care if Earth gets trolled in the process. We have to warn him! And fast! <laughs> Har har, this is a stupid gag. But I'm also annoyed by how this character was just a cold-hearted asshole when the kids were around, but is the comic relief any other time in the movie. I know this is an animated movie with very few, if any, physical laws, but it's still ridiculous that Gru is slamming on brakes or yanking on the controls when this is now literally a hunk of metal sliding down the street with no braking mechanism aside from a f***ing parachute. Of course, Vector has a shrunken moon-sized receptacle on the outside of his border wall. Missiles are clearly shown as being dangerous, but the first time Gru was here, he took on many more and survived. So why do we care now? Damn, Gru's gone back and forth to space, was in close proximity, to a missile and is now back up in the atmosphere. He's gonna need to pop his ears something fierce after this shit's over. Ah! Nefario ex machina. Also, how did Dr. Nefario and the minions know that Gru would be coming to Vector's lair? He only knew about the shrink ray's effects wearing off and was just trying to warn Gru and should have no knowledge about the kids or Vector. Moon decides to pause its enlargement for several minutes after this point for dramatic effect. You're going to have to jump! Jump? Are you insane? Yeah, but nothing bad ever happens to anyone in this movie regardless of what they do, so f*** it. Not so fast! I gotta hand it to Vector. He's great at being an asshole villain. Much better than Gru. But I never wanted to punch an animated character in the face more in my entire life. All these assholes were able to make a minion chain faster than gravity could pull Gru and Margot to the ground, allowing them to be caught right at the last second. The moon, which has still not increased size since its growth spurt three minutes ago, smartly tries to check its way out of this move. Also, why is there a giant red button that's sole purpose is to make the escape pod go straight up? God damn it, movie, I want you to science! But once again, law enforcement is baffled! There's law enforcement in this movie? Okay, girls, time for bed. Wait, the orphanage let Gru readopt these girls? Not only did he give them back a couple days ago, he directly influenced their kidnapping from the recital. You've turned out to be a great parent. <laughs> to be fair, he's only been a parent for a few weeks at the most. Let's not cash that sentiment in just yet. Oh good, the moon is back in the sky, but now it's a super close Bruce Almighty supermoon, and we're all gonna die when it gets sucked into our gravitational pull. Many minutes of maddening moronic minioning. Comcast. Ta -da! Ta -da! If you think this 14 seconds of unnecessary minioning just for a f***ing logo is annoying, well, then you should immediately drug yourself before watching the actual movie. Slow rolling. Jesus, can't any characters that are prominently yellow say anything comprehensible in these movies? El Macho has a magical magnet ship that lifts metallic things off the ground dramatically one by one, instead of all at the same time like a normal magnet. This guy loves his gun so much that he refuses to let it go, even when he's being pulled up high enough that certain death is imminent. Cool shot and all, but why are metal objects falling? I thought everything was being sucked up into the magnetic space croissant. Ah! Arctic Circle Helm Scream! Motherfucker! It takes all of three minutes to literally head straight into the toilet. Also, haha, -ha, movie. But you're saying this guy went through the magnet lifting the porta potty up, then dropping it from a terrific height, but he just kept reading the fucking paper? In this version of the universe, the Arctic Circle is located near South Sudan, considering these latitude longitude numbers. This shows Gru caring for the girls since he's going all out for Agnes's party. But what's really concerning is the height of that fucking basketball goal over the garage. How the hell are three small girls supposed to play on that bull? 
I know this is a ridiculous animated world and all, but what's the body count for this party on this attraction alone? Gru's house came with a pre-installed fairy princess pulley system. Also, Gru seems like a pretty large man, so why is it that he can be successfully hoisted by three Dr. Mario pills with goggles? It is I, Gru's Zinker Bell! Since the fairy princess just canceled a few minutes ago, this suggests Gru had this entire getup, which fits perfectly at the ready. How come you're so fat? That's racist. A friend Natalie is recently single. Natalie apparently went a little overboard pre-gaming Agnes's birthday party. Kyle! No! Do not do your business on the petunia! Those are friends. Go crazy. If this is what happens when Kyle takes a leak, the entire yard should be a wasteland. Mr. Gru? Lucy sounds suspiciously like Ms. Hattie from the first movie. Are we sure that Ms. Hattie hasn't assumed a new identity after having gastric bypass surgery? No one in this entire neighborhood witnesses this woman beating and running over a man with her car, allowing her to get away with his kidnapping scot-free. Movie tells me pretty early it's going to continue the series' assault on perspective and physics, and I'm so thankful I'm going to add ten extra sins for the remaining bullshit of its runtime. <laughs> Minions have witnessed the entirety of Gru's kidnapping and trunk stuffage, but do nothing until she starts to drive away. This little asshole must have magnets in his back pocket. Otherwise, there's no reason he should remain seated on the back of this car. I know Lucy's focused on driving here, but Gru's in the trunk, so you'd think she'd check the rearview mirror a couple of times. But no, let's let this minion-y tomfoolery unfold for an interminable amount of time. No one in this bustling pedestrian area noticed any of that minion-capturing bullshit. Movie continues the tradition of its main characters acting in very non-discreet and borderline dangerous ways with absolutely no consequence. Why'd Lucy go to the trouble of tasing these assholes a few seconds ago anyway? They're wide f***ing awake, but now she doesn't have any issues with them? Presumably because she knows how many toys they're gonna sell? We interrupt this Despicable Me movie to bring you Finding Nemo 2, Find It Harder. We are the anti-villain league. <laughs> a secret league that is so secret they didn't even exist in the first movie, even though people were stealing pyramids, shrink rays, and the moon. But you want to melt the polar ice caps? Or even steal the moon? Then we notice. Which is why we mostly just sit around with our thumbs in our assholes, because there are only three or four people in the world that want to do that. Agent Wild. Oh, me now? Obvious Judy Greer character is inexplicably not voiced by Judy Greer. The lab was devoted to experiments involving PX-41. A serum that could only be tested in the Arctic Circle because of reasons. Was this scientist unaware of what the serum was going to do to this bunny? Or were the other scientists in the building just sick of his so they picked him to test this stuff on this rabbit, knowing that the rabbit might kill it. You know how a villain thinks, how a villain acts. And you guys don't? I thought you were the main line of defense against supervillains. How the f*** have you been doing your jobs up until this point? This submarine, which is only a short boat trip away from what has to be f***ing Malibu, somehow quietly surfaced during Gru's conversation, even though the entirety of it was submerged just a few minutes ago. Michael! <sighs> Hilarious and all, but isn't the whole point of having minions making them do menial sh like rowing all the way back to f***ing dry land? said she was arranging a date for you. Yeah, well, she is a nut job and I'm not going on any date. Steve Carell must have thought the voice of Gru had too much nuance in the last movie and decided to shout his dialogue in the sequel. Also, I don't know why it's so hard for Gru to get a date with his obvious advantage in a 69. This is why the jellies and jams business hasn't taken off. These minions make everything inefficient. The movie really knows how to cater to its key demographic. Kids today are huge Carmen Miranda fans. <laughs> The fact that I was actively rooting for this minion to hit the cold metal of the lab floor tells you exactly my opinion of these piss-flavored tater tots. Just because everybody hates it doesn't mean it's not good! Gru is compelled to lie about the quality of this jelly for some reason, even though his livelihood hinges on this being a quality product that sells well. Even though there are distinct differences among the minions up close, for this wide shot the animators just went Control c Control v a few dozen times. The 21 Fartcon Salute! So the product that was not so hilariously made on accident in the last movie is what is now used to honor its inventor. Uh, I counted 22. <laughs> God damn this movie for half of its jokes so far being fart-based. miss you already! So Gru's letting Nefario go to join an evil lap, but when you give up evil yourself, do you just ignore other villains? Many of which could affect your newly clean life? Is the motto evil and let evil? The vacuum was well past the door before this little yellow dick was attacked, but it's right in the middle of it here. I guess Nefario took a couple passes on the rug before leaving. Also, Dr. Nefario literally just left the lab, but came around to the front door and then did this little ruse to kidnap one of these little fuckers. Couldn't he have just asked one of them to go with? Are you sure we should be doing this? Given the unfettered internet access for these kids, I assume this means Agnes's first exposure to two girls one cup. Out of all the ridiculous sh** in this movie, the one thing I'm not believing is a world where people still go to the mall. It is the cupcake recipe I got off the internet. Then who the hell made all that stuff? And where did they go? A much more interesting backstory would be about Lucy's blinding hatred of desserts, and how their mere presence induces white-hot rage boners. You, you got... you got a... 
a little... Grew's covered with icing, but Lucy's hands, which did all the baked good f***ery, are frosting free. I guess the only way this minion romantic fantasy can end is with full body insertion, and that's dangerous for everyone involved. Hard to tell if Gru just automatically pictures all people in Lucha Libre masks and just lucked out identifying El Macho. It's the big hurry. I just, I have a lot of work to do. Gru makes plans to abandon his young children for the second time in the first half hour of this movie. <laughs> what are these assholes celebrating? They haven't done anything, and quite a few of them should be on constant guard of their formerly evil lair. If this is just some random f***ing Tuesday, then these little defective sausage links have a serious problem. Kevin, Jerry, watch the girls for me, okay? Dave, Stuart, come this way, with me! It's not that I don't know these minions have names, like Dave and Kevin and Sammy and Dick and Francis and all that. It's just that I don't care. Also, I'm not entirely sure these four names don't apply to all the minions. And the subtle difference in shape defines which one is a Kevin and which one is a Dave. Get it off of me! Get it off of me! Get it off of me! This goes on for some time. Also, I know Lucy initiated this clumsy break-in, but why is Gru suddenly a bumbling idiot? He's successfully executed many dangerous heists before, but when he's breaking into a mall restaurant, he turns into Inspector f***ing Clouseau. Not only are these x-ray goggles, they also change the color of things that are potentially of interest to the wearer of said goggles. If this is what happens when an ice cream truck drives by, why haven't the minions been outed long before now? Oh no. That's not good. Busy man is so busy, he's throwing away a beverage that's still piping hot. Well, we thought we'd come visit you at work. So we got a cab, or stole a car. God damn it, why does everyone have immediate fantasies about this woman? You love her. You love her, you love her. Of all the ridiculous things these characters have done in plain view of other people, this is what gets people to stop and stare. Okay, these shops look like they all belong in a shopping mall. Like the bridal place right there, the restaurant of course, and even the hair club. What the fuck is this place? A speakeasy casino? In the mall? <laughs> Man, Edith is incredibly dry for someone who just emerged from the water. Movie continues to pad its runtime by accosting me with this Disney Channel bullshit that contributes nothing to the plot. If it picks up any traces of the serum, the sensor in your belt buckle will make a sound like this. Me more, me more. Sensor technology was sadly invented the day after they broke into El Mancho's restaurant to find the serum. Also, this little tidbit is explained to Gru right before he walks into the store to look for the serum, instead of earlier when he is given the fancy belt. <laughs> Forcible salsa course. He likes me. This chicken kicked Gru's ass last night and should have no problem doing it again, but only makes one futile attempt at biting Gru here. I guess it's playing the long con. Gru discovered traces of the serum at Eagle Hair Club. Interesting. No, not interesting. It's the breakthrough of your whole investigation. Why do we have to have all this bullshit about dating and bakery and minions when we have a fairly interesting mystery plot that could be explored? I almost want to take us in off for featuring a Mungo Jerry song, but then I realize this f***ing track is featured in almost every movie beach scene, so sin it I shall. Also, Despicable Me sequel continues the bartender is Isaac from Love Boat sight gag, even though nobody in the audience, including the kid's parents, know who Isaac from Love Boat is. Wait, so the French maid minion that Defario captured earlier is here? But why? If he wanted a bunch of the minions from the get-go, he could have taken them then. The ice cream truck stunt was just a waste of gas and inventioning. Mini dipping. Hey Lance, where the heck is Kevin? This dick doesn't care about many of his brethren being kidnapped, nor is he interested in telling Gru that almost all of his workforce is out of the office today. Tell Jillian I'm not here! Why the f*** is Jillian here in the first place? I thought this was supposed to be a movie about Gru working for the good guys to find another bad guy, when it seems to be more about Gru sitting around his house, or his adopted daughters going to the mall, or other things that make me want to... What was it, Gru? <laughs> yeah, that's it. If I have to watch Gru go on a date or something, I'm turning this shit off. God damn it! I'm being told by the YouTube gods, mostly Chris, that I have to continue. There's just so many phonies out there. Yes, I hear you. Movie can't decide if it's Mission Impossible or Crazy Stupid Love, but definitely sucks at being both. <laughs> Gru is not immediately calling Bill Cosby's attorney right now. Oh, she's just, uh... <laughs> oh, 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 see. This restaurant has massively high tolerance for people passing out into their food. I guess this really is set in Los Angeles. The straight-up drugging and torture of this poor lady, who was conceited and polite, but certainly not horrible, is played as a casual meet-cute between our actual protagonists. Of course this is a f***ing kids movie. Also, when Lucy Knock grew unconscious earlier in the film, she put him in the trunk. But this woman gets to be tied to the roof for all the world to see. Definitely gonna remove a sin for this dope Pharrell track, but it also reminds me that this song lost the Oscar to Let It Go that year. Let it go! Let it go? I can't dance in my car to that bullsh**. For the egregious Academy error, I'll remove two more sins. You're welcome for us. It's empty, but we found traces of the PX41 serum in it. He's our man. Even though the jar is empty and the contents are the extremely dangerous part of this situation, we're going to completely blow our secret cover and expose it all over the small floor in front of everyone. What now? Well, now you're free to go back to your business. Wait, Gru didn't get paid for this shit? 
I know he's got some decent money, but I'd be shaking this well-funded government agency down for my efforts. Also, why did they need Gru's help at all? If they knew the serum was in the mall somewhere, why did they need a former villain to smoke it out? A regular agent could just go around and interview the very few business owners in this small shopping center. Looks like they need you, so... Bye, Gru. Romantic leads start off hating each other, but realize they respect and even love the other person before some entity forces them to separate before proper copulation cliché. 20 seconds of Gru returning to old school Gruage. Gotta play the hits, kids. Also, I guess Pharrell didn't get a sad song composed for this montage. Every time we've seen this door open, it's opened into the house. Is Gru's front door like one of those industrial kitchen doors that swings both ways? That doesn't seem secure. I hate you. This flamethrower would be excellent at CinemaSins. The fact that actual kids copied this noise frequently and openly after seeing this movie earns it five additional sins. And that'll be more if you keep this up, young man. Kenpai, kenpai. Minions normally speak gibberish, but also know how to use a traditional Japanese toast. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, however many times Gru f***s this passcode up, the hilariously ineffective security system whiffs. I guess only the penitent man will pass. Maybe this movie's trying to start a whole character realizes she's in love via a series of frightening hallucinations cliche, but I'm not buying it. This is cool and all, but I'm still confused over why she karate chopped all those f***ing cupcakes earlier. You are El Macho! That's right! But where the hell did that tattoo of the Mexican flag on his chest go? You remember it, right? The joke that went on for several seconds too long earlier in the film? Not specific enough? Oh. So this is your new job opportunity? Absolutely. And because, just like in the last movie, all the world's villains live within a short drive of each other in Discount LA, this should not be a shock to group. He is an indestructible, mindless, Killing machine! Ah! But weren't these f***ers already indestructible machines? I mean, one of them was still alive in space the last movie. The movie has certainly proved me wrong. I thought I was bothered by the large groups of jaundice-ridden dildos the last movie introduced us to, but this army of tweaked-out grimaced f***s is far worse. How the hell did Lucy know that Gru was going to the Cinco de Mayo party? And even if she guessed he'd be attending, wouldn't it make more sense to go back to his house and wait him out there? The last act of this movie is set in motion due to a silly move by a supposedly smart redhead, so I'll call this the Lois Lane effect. He never mentioned that you were both working for the anti-villain league. Lucy, who is supposed to be a highly trained spy, allowed her actual work badge to be stolen by a chicken. <laughs> it really does sound silly when you say it out loud. <laughs> Gru takes the motorbike of villainy, or whatever the f*** it's called, instead of his normal Grumobile, because this franchise can't be dependent on only selling minion toys. When the f*** did El Macho find the time to load up all these new minions into the rockets, let alone place the rockets outside? Gru had just left the still raging party and turned right back around. Okay, let's talk about El Macho's plan. He faked his own death at the height of his popularity for no reason, then hid out by opening a Mexican restaurant in a f***ing mall in a busy city. I guess, biding his time until this serum was developed in the Arctic Circle and Dr. Nefario is available to be recruited because Gru's not villaining anymore, and he just happened to have a bunch of minions to test the serum on? I don't even know what he wants to do with these things anyway, other than evil, evil, indestructible. But really, how many f***ing things had to go f***ing right for him to enact this incredibly incoherent plan? Also, did El Macho have to get a loan from the bank to execute his evil plan? Or is he just rolling deep with salsa e salsa money? And if he is, why the hell is he bothering with this Instead of being at El Macho's place, where there are many more evil minions that could use that antidote. This castle door opens to a ton of wild, uncontrollable evil minion assholes, but none of them leave the area. I mean, why are they doing anything El Macho wants? Jesus, another Dr. Nefario ex machina for the second movie in a row. This movie is the laziest attempt to be ambitious I've ever seen. What's happening to my minions? Where the balls has El Macho been? There's been an uninvited visitor, an evil minion uprising, and a f***ing firefight full of antidote going on for the last several minutes. I imagine the pitch for this last act was something like, the Green Goblin Wolverine takes the serum and becomes Grimace, who King Kongs for a little bit. But then Harry Potter remembered he had the Basilisk Tooth, and then the bad guy does a Jim Carrey impression before he's defeated. Also, when El Macho demonstrated the power of this serum, he showed the Kevin monster get shot and burned and eat a police car. All those things seem more dangerous than a taser, yet here we see Gru tase this supposedly indestructible purple monster El Macho, and he reacts just like a normal person would. Well, we're done with the villain, but there's ten minutes of runtime left, so we'll definitely get a bunch of singing minion bullshit. Also, I'm really annoyed that even though the minions are dressed like Backstreet Boys, they're singing I Swear, which was performed by the greatly superior boy band All For One. Wow, you think this minion orgy is bad at the end of the movie? What's even worse is they invited the woman they drugged, tortured, and left for dead. And she showed up! In case I've been unclear before, I'll say it again. F these f***ing post credit scenes. F*** them right in the ear. This minion dorchestra kicks off wall-to-wall -wall movie insanity. 
Jeez, movie. You can't wait five seconds before you start minioning? Just bring on the minpocalypse already. Also, sh like this is what terrified parents were worried about suffering through for 90 minutes. Very nice of Illumination to make it clear from the beginning those fears were justified. Comcast. All those fans of Look Who's Talking that thought all movies had been missing over the last 30 years were opening credits involving the conception and birth of a species with a 60s pop song backing track had those fan petitions finally paid off. Minions. Roll narrations. Minions have been on this planet far longer than we have. And yet they've evolved into a compulsively subservient species, rather than advance according to Darwinian logic. Also, did the Minions evolve their trademark goggles or make them? And if so, out of what? And for that matter, why? Weren't they underwater creatures who could see throughout their entire first stages? Dear God, are we even two minutes in yet? That one is Norbert. Yeah. He's an idiot. That's racist. They all share the same goal. <laughs> to serve the most despicable master they could find. So the producers of this movie then? Why did the minion skirts change from full skirts to just loin leaves? Were the animation teams of the different segments not allowed to talk to each other? It wasn't easy for these guys, but they never gave up. Clearly, somehow they managed to survive the extinction of an entire species. You can't blame this one just on the minions, right? Even if they thought it would somehow stay upright, why would they be celebrating in this exact spot? Their new master had a tendency to party all night and sleep all day. I swear to God, I just broke out into a cold sweat thinking this might be some sort of Hotel Transal Minion mashup. This would be the peanut butter and chocolate of immature CG kids flicks. Except the ingredients are sh and more sh Reese's feces? Why would a vampire sleep in a room with a giant window in the first place? Seriously, I'm starting to think the minions are getting a bad rap here. This is the entire movie in a snow shell. Stupidity followed by laughter over and over and over and over again. It's like if Seinfeld did an entire episode where Kramer just kept manically entering rooms. Where do you go when you need relief from the comic relief? He would not return until he had found his tribe the biggest, baddest villain to serve. So are we seriously rooting for these little bastards? They've been in here for enough time that, like, they could be trying to recruit Hitler, right? Try putting that in a kid's movie. So what exactly is the distinction in Minion's world between the one-eyed and the two-eyed? Is it their gender differentiation? And if so, I'm assuming the one-eyed monster is the Malian? <laughs> Feels like I should give the movie credit for going almost nine minutes without a fart joke, but it's still a f***ing fart joke. Kevin felt pride. Narration the movie continues, as we are now ten minutes into this thing with nothing more than uninteresting narrated backstory, Minion gibberish, and the occasional pratfall. In fact, let's just tack on 50 sins here for the ton of illumination. Also, Jesus jumping gibberish. Whose idea was it again to center a movie around characters that don't actually talk? It would be the equivalent of DreamWorks releasing a Galaxy Quest spin-off with the Thermians speaking in their native language for 90 minutes. Yes, the banana joke is a recurring bit and maybe was funny at some point, but overused stick aside, where the f*** did Stuart get a fresh banana? No one will be seated during the minions walking across different types of terrain portion of the movie. Huh? Banana? Hungry Castaway sees people as types of delicious food cliché. I guess these f Squads took their geographical strategy from the actual Despicable Me movies. They were somehow able to row from wherever the f they were in the permafrost all the way to New York City. And there were no ships milling about until right now. Friday the 13th, Part 8, Minions Take Manhattan. Even in 1968, especially in 1968, I'm not buying that the water outside of Manhattan is this clean. This Nixon joke must have killed with the under 10 historical politician crowd. Banana! This movie is bananaing my brain to the banana -th degree. I'm adding another 20 sins for the banana of it. I guess the purpose of those goggles are finally revealed, and it's solely to provide a zoom and enhance cliche. Is this a changing room? I mean, I know things were different in the 60s, but how did they build changing rooms big enough to dress elephants? Also, how is there no sign out front to keep randoms from wandering in? You're telling me in literally the entirety of history that these yellow dumb marines have existed. They've never learned how to mirror? Okay, not only did the announcer ladies see one of the minions walking around and did nothing about it. Hey, what are you doing? There's no overnight security at this highfalutin department store? I'll give the movie credit for picking three shows that could have been on primetime at the same time in 1968, but both The Dating Game and Bewitched were on ABC, and therefore could not have been airing at the same time. Also, what are the chances each time they change the channel, it's at the exact moment the title card for the show comes up? I'm calling Bananigans. Also, also, what fancy department store in the 60s sold popcorn and sodas? You're watching the Top Secret Villain Network channel. And by Top Secret, you mean so easy to find three poops accidentally their way to it by using an umbrella and a blender? Got it. Also, how convenient that they turned it on right at the beginning of the expositional part of today's broadcast schedule. So evil. What's up with the upskirt, though? Was this movie directed by Zack Snyder, then also directed by Joss Whedon? How did this black and white newscast all of a sudden add a color? Despicable Me franchise continues its overt assault on physics, providing zero explanation about how the minions get on top of the Brooklyn f***ing bridge. I hate laugh tracks, but at least if this movie had one, I'd know when the movie itself thinks it's being funny. Growing uh, boy-like creatures need their strength. <laughs> Why are the minions so freaked out about Mrs. Nelson and her 
their knife? Don't they enjoy being around potential villainy? I thought it was their whole thing. If this family has actual guns and bazookas, why not use those instead of that f***ing paintball pea shooter that jams easily? Scar that overkill! She started out as your average little girl. Braces, pigtails. I know even more than the next guy that movies have to exposition, but hyperactive child exposition is now officially my least favorite way to go about it. We're here for uh, so much fun. It's a crime. What happens if a non-villain con attendee pulls up behind a villainous Winnebago while this shit's going down? What are these water mine looking ceiling decorations that no one will even see? And what the hell is this f***ing wrench for? Movie tries to be clever about its Gru and Nefario cameo here, but of course can't wait to Gru all over our faces even more before it's over. Oh, where to go, guys? We killed the original! Let's say we grant that time travel works this way. Why would their disappearances be staggered? And why would it be on delay? Even the time travel in this movie is trying to have a sense of f***ing comedic timing. When I started out, people said a woman could never rob a bank as well as a man. Well, times change. Who knew that Minions was Sandy B's prep work for Ocean's 8? We have one thing in common. We were born with flippers! There is no way that overly excited Gil friend here A believes this, or B would jump up and shout about it, or C, how is this even supposed to be funny? That job is mine! Why the sh are all these villains, many of whom are famous enough to be featured in magazines, clamoring to work for another villain? Loner, lone gunman, get it? That's the whole point! All these villains, and yet I still have the bear. Stuffed bear, why am I holding a bear? Because the movie needed Bob to cough up the ruby so that they'd be your henchmen. Now as to how it actually happened that you ended up holding a bear and Bob ended up swallowing a ruby, the movie is too busy trying to get from point E to point T to actually care enough to explain anything from F to U. Singing in the rain? How dare you, movie. I swear on the ghost of Gene Kelly, there is more humor in one single Donald O'Connor pratfall than the entirety of this movie. The nerve. Damn, there are several casual deaths in this movie, and this is probably the casualist. Good old Big Ben. How would we ever know which movies happened in London without you? I love it. Oh, that works out because I love... <laughs> I know this is the Illumination aesthetic for drawing humans, but I can't stop thinking that a 69 between these two would be potentially lethal. Checking out my can. Ham-handed ham handily hatches horrible hammy humor. Yes, we've reached the out of hope and aimlessly wandering phase of this Minions movie. Haven't I already seen this in the fourth season of The Walking Dead? Not only is the entrance to the super secret control room unlocked, it's got automatic doors, so you have no choice but to discover that <laughs> Also, how is the wall of technology even supposed to be used? Why would you have monitors, gauges, and buttons 20 feet out of your reach and sight? It'll be my ultimate weapon, but right now it's leaking radiation, like you would not believe. Even in 1968, people were aware that being in the same room with something leaking radiation was not a good thing. Right? No, no, don't say anything. I won't understand. We couldn't have said it better ourselves, Sandy. We couldn't have said it better ourselves. The wolf offered the three piggies and all their friends a job working for her. But how exactly does Scarlet know that there are more minions? All the three little piggies had to do was just steal one little crown. Wait, didn't we already get this bit of exposition about stealing the crown earlier? Exposition me once, shame on you. Exposition me twice, I won't get expositioned again. Good luck getting that crown tomorrow, little piggies. I know you won't disappoint me. But they're henchmen and she's the master criminal, so they're very likely to disappoint her. Why wouldn't Scarlet have any ideas or plans to share with them? And or why isn't she the one pulling off the heist and having them assist her where needed? Whoa, movie. If you're going to pretend to be self-aware enough to make a location card gag, you're going to have to start actually explaining how these same minions have existed since the beginning of time. But if the person that's being hypnotized can't understand what the hypnotizer is saying, then how is one hypnotized? Movie has time for this, or movie finds this funny. Take your pick. You think he's funny to mock the elderly, do ya? I wish this was a question someone brought up in the writer's room for this movie. I get they're small, but there is 0% chance this was big enough a space for all three of them to hide, even in a film that repeatedly says, f*** it, this is an animated movie, so whatever goes. Why wouldn't you use these go-go minion arms and legs to simply reach out and grab the crown? All oh, right, because this movie prioritizes silliness over anything that makes a lick of sense. Jeez, movie, Spider-Man too much? Is this scene gonna end with an unconscious Bob crowd surfing in the carriage? Bob? who appears to be a bald, jaundiced child. <laughs> Fine. Okay, that was actually funny. But if you think you're getting a sin removed for one good joke, you've got another sin coming. Which legend dictates makes him the new king? <laughs> Tiny yellow traitor! But didn't Bob do exactly what Scarlet wanted him to do in stealing the crown? Not sure I understand all this hostility. Wow, are we really filling time right now with this exodus of the Minionites nonsense? Why am I supposed to care about how the rest of these fellow yellows make it to England? Discount Ethan Hunt. So I guess they had these yellow hats available on the off chance a minion would pull King Arthur's sword out of the stone and become King of England? Also, how does this actually work? Does Elizabeth have to marry Bob? What if there was already a king? Minions brings up so many questions that I'm seriously 100% fine with never having the answers to. Why do the banners have just one eye? Stuart is the one with one eye, but Bob's the king, right? King Bob! 
Seven. Right, like any modern country would ever stand for a dolt of a leader who could barely speak the language and is so narcissistic they basically spend their lives shouting out their own name. And how exactly do the minions speak partial English? If they can repeat and understand English verbiage, then why aren't they just speaking in English the whole time? Seems a bit odd that this movie spent so much of its budget on rights to 60s hits that not one person in the target demographic will have a clue as to what it is. They could have just as easily played some public domain John Tesh and it would have had the same effect. Unfunny Corgi abuse is decidedly unfunny. It was an itsy bitsy teeny weeny yellow block can't be unseen. -y. Also, does this fire hydrant threesome mean that minions have sex drives? And I just realized rule 34 applies to minions and I would like to be done existing now, thanks. Ow. Dare you? Apparently it's super easy to get into Buckingham Palace. So easy, in fact, I can't understand why Scarlet hadn't already stolen the crown a few times prior to even hiring the minions. And you definitely cannot just give the job to this woman. There are laws. Like the laws that let you crown a yellow phallic symbol because he pulled a sword from a stone? Based on these hecklers in the background, it looks like Parliament is no more sophisticated than a Green Bay Packers game. And you have stolen not just England, but my heart. And the last 90 minutes of my life the rest of your worthless little lives. Why exactly is Scarlett Joe Manson here locking the minions away? Even if her feelings got hurt, it's been obvious they're willing to do just about anything for her and are too stupid to really cause her trouble. What's the upside to this idea? They clearly don't have necks. What exactly did Herb think would happen? The hair in that picture? It's just two wavy lines! Fabrice would be excellent at cinema sins. Ah yes, what every respectable torture chamber contains, an obvious and easily escapable drain. Minion Tui! Really? So the minions are like the Forrest Gump of 60s England? My mom always told me that life is like a box of minions. It starts out somewhat cute, but very quickly becomes annoying, exhausting, and full of idiots. As our, I'm gonna say protagonists, run around this giant screw-on chandelier, which is apparently a thing, can someone tell me why I care about what's about to happen? Am I supposed to be rooting against Scarlet, who hasn't really done anything all that evil? Am I supposed to want what the minions want? Am I supposed to even know what that is? Because if this is just a series of pratfalls and gibberish jokes and nothing else, it basically amounts to the world's worst try not to laugh compilation video. And I'm totally up to the challenge. This is no longer a coronation. It is an execution! Pretty sure you gotta go through the coronation process before you start handing out execution orders, but what do I know, England? Damn, that's quite a pop-up thunderstorm. It was barely even cloudy when the minions entered the abbey all of two minutes ago. Kevin. Kevin. I know you're out there. No, you don't, but the scriptwriters need this moment, so of course Kevin just happens to be watching. I will do it, Kevin, if you are not back here by dawn. And ten seconds later, Kevin turns the corner and it's already dawn. How is he supposed to be there that quick? What if he hadn't even seen that message? Follow me! Not trying to fat shame, but seriously, if none of the other villains can outrun the sumo guy, then Kevin is in the clear. Honor! It's just my head! Huh, I guess Roger Goodell actually has a writing credit on this movie. In what way could this machine have ever been used that didn't result in its own destruction? Seems like a giant design flaw, no? What exactly did Lipstick Lady run into? When we see out the windshield, there's nothing directly in front of her. Is that a completely implausible, three-story, fully functional, nine-booster space shuttle type rocket under your dress? Or are you just happy to see me? This joke is yet another reminder that this entire movie is simply, as they say in England, taking the piss. So that's your plan? Make yourself a bigger target? Does it really matter how big Kevin is if Scarlet's just gonna display some vintage stormtrooper aim? Jesus, more innocent people die in minions than the entirety of London has fallen. Gerard Butler, thy name is Mud. <laughs> He's survived- oh, who am I kidding? Minions are immortal and we all know it. So if Kevin shrank, then why didn't the overalls? Also, since when have minions worn underwear? Not that I'm complaining, but this movie has been so addicted to crack, I'm almost wondering if I'm personally responsible for manifesting them. Oh, spectacular! <laughs> I'm so proud of you boys. I haven't seen Michael Keaton and Alice and Janney this wasted since that legendary Batman West Wing crossover party got out of hand. From here on out, you are Sir Kevin. Well done. But they're all still going to jail for handing the crown and, in effect, the entire country over to a super criminal, right? Because that happened. Don't cry because it happened, cheer because it's over. Actually, do both. Both works fine. Man, this movie does not paint a flattering picture of the London police force. Is anyone except the minions even trying to stop Gru? He was evil. He was perfect. He was. An obvious and unnecessary reference to a previous movie? Comcast. This already annoying logo, which I'm going to go ahead and give five cents for, introduces the first fart joke in under a minute of the movie's runtime. <laughs> the rulebook states that if a joke of this nature occurs in under a minute, then the movie shall be levied a fart tax of ten more cents. But it all came to an end in season three. I've been a bad boy! So did Balthazar go into puberty just now on the show? And they continued filming? Leading us all to wonder... Where is he now? This leads me to wonder who's watching this hard copy show. Why is this the format they use for Balthazar's backstory if we're just gonna cut to the present day version? Playing a villain on TV was fun, but being one in real life? 
is even better! Trey Parker voices a character in a Despicable Me movie, and I couldn't be more shocked if they announced a basketball too. Also, Boast's position. Or is it Boat's position? I mean, I guess it's Boat's position. Also, also, introducing Balthazar Brett, a character that seems entirely inspired by Peter Dinklage's character in Pixels, which was based on Billy Mitchell from The King of Kong, but mostly the Pixels thing because it sucks. How is that heist music? Sorry, my bad. Balthazar made a mixtape that has love songs on one side and heist music on another. I know this is a cartoon, but who does that? Also, when Clive flips over the tape, he flips it at 180 degrees right to left, making this cassette player nigh impossible. This is a terrible movie, but it's even worse when you realize that a significant portion of the budget was used to get the rights to a f***ing Michael Jackson song. Even if Balthazar is the sneakiest character in the world, his speedboat should have already announced his presence to these two ships, even if the lookout is only concerned with looking in one direction. Nice try at pettiness illumination, but you can really only start throwing shade after you've made something as good as Finding Nemo. Any explanation given for how the convenient weaponized bubblegum works? No? God, f*** this movie already, and it hasn't even been five minutes. Silas sounded the alarm about the heist after it was ongoing, and Balthazar just got the diamond. So how did Gru and Lucy get here so fast? Were they just out riding around in their torpedoes for fun? In the exact location as the ship with the diamond? He's getting the way! That's what he thinks! If this is really the faster form of transportation, why didn't they ride these f***ers the entire time? Uh. <laughs> you guys are so cute. This girl, who thinks the minions are cute, must have missed out on all the assholes in the world using these f***ers as teeth-grinding memes for the last seven years. You'd think after just one time having a weapon knocked out of these guys' hands, they'd stop standing so close to each other. But that would ruin whatever gag this is supposed to be. Ah! Grudity. Jesus Christ, in the first seven minutes alone, they've packed in at least 7,534 80s references. Can't wait till they get to the slap bracelets in Act 2. Happy birthday, dear Dan! Ha ha ha, funny bit. But if Gru's this close to the window, that means this building is currently being destroyed by the floating ship. So are these beach babes actually gonna f*** these minions? I mean, I'm not judging. I just wanna know how that's supposed to work. And if they have the proper protection against minions. No one on this beach either noticed or cared that a giant freighter floating above their heads is being boarded by heavily armed government agents. There must be some awesome molly available at this beach. Why even bother with the subterfuge of disguising the entrance to the headquarters if the transport occurs out in the wide f***ing open? Is everyone in this universe incapable of looking up? Which one of you losers is Agent Gru? Valerie enacted her hostile takeover of the AVL and was promoted from the head office, but she doesn't know who f***ing Gru is, either from his villain or hero days. Oh, it's the girls! Who apparently don't age over the course of seven years of movies. How could you let Balthazar Brat, the AVL's most wanted villain, just get away! Wait, Balthazar is the AVL's most wanted villain? So why didn't you send... EVERYONE! I mean... I want every agent in the area on the scene immediately! Silas told everyone in the area to go there, but how is that only Gru and Lucy? Are they based in Miami? You're fired! This highly secretive agency feels the best way to fire their agents is to throw them out in the clear view of the public. Today, Lucy and I were invited to not work at the AVL anymore. What's the problem, though? Sure, the agency's probably provided some good benefits, but Gru was independently wealthy, even after he stopped being a villain in the last movie. No! Censorship. You can gamble online! That's what Katie's dad does! And let's not go over to Katie's house anymore. Gru still has minions and a shit ton of weaponry, but bans the kids from being exposed to the real evil shit, like PokerStars.com. Bueno? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Also, you knew this highlight reel of good Gru and evil Gru couldn't go without at least two sh jokes. Lisa me lipo, Pomodoro la comquit. Over two movies, Gru hasn't said sh in Minionese, but all of a sudden he breaks that sh out here, all in the service of an unfunny joke. You guys, don't stop right now, there will be consequences. Mel's trying to Norma Ray the minions here, but if they're so fixated on villainy, why didn't they strike during the last movie when they had the exact same reservations? In case you confused it with Paris Sierra Leone. The chief of police sent me. He was concerned that during the recent heist attempt, the Dumont diamond was replaced with a phony. <gasps> we find out later this is Balthazar in disguise, but seriously, wouldn't a museum have already conducted this test? And then wonder why the police chief is telling a gem expert to go to the museum unannounced? I guess a villain needs to make a dramatic escape in most instances, but can he just walk out the front door? He sleep darted the entire museum staff. Now, as I was saying, Goodbye. Considering Gru just committed an extremely casual homicide, he may as well go back into full villainy. After you and your brother were born, your father and I divorced. And someone was there to document the exact moment you guys fell out of love, decided to divorce, and separate the kids with a short burst of Polaroids. We each took one son to raise on our own and promised never to see each other again. And this agreement was totally fine with him, whatever laws were in place at the time. Also, why did Drew wait so long to contact Gru? 
Just because their parents divorced, it doesn't mean he wasn't allowed to find him all this time. This is the family business. The largest pig farm in the whole of Fredonia. Hard to believe the pig farm's still in business, considering they just leave these assholes anywhere on the property, including the runway. No! That's my private part! <laughs> Holy sh! I think I just sighed so hard I cracked a rib. <laughs> It's almost like they told Steve Carell, try and do something more annoying than Minions. And this is what happened after take 1,057. How is my brother finding a wife like you when he is so bald? That's baldest. This is the best! <laughs> yes, the best! Alright, let's go home now. Screw was super goddamn excited about meeting his twin, who's been nothing but nice to his family. But one crack about him being bald immediately softened his brother boner. Now you can be as evil as Balthazar Brat! How the hell was this show a hit? Even if Brat's considered cool in the 80s, he does a bunch of evil sh**, right? Were kids ready for the anti-hero concept back then? Oh, it's too bad Gru won't be around to try and stop me. How does Brat know that Gru was fired? Does he have an unexplained mole deep in the AVL's HR department? The pig farm was just a cover for the real family business. Damn, Drew wasted no time in telling Gru about his sinister family background. How does he know Gru's not still working for the AVL? Our dad was a villain. Oh, not just a villain, but one of the greatest of all time. Gru worked for the AVL, where surely someone would have made mention that his dad was a villain. Unless the AVL simply erases all evidence of all the villains they've ever gone after. Even though the front of the car is pointing down during the fall, this grappling hook shoots at the top of the cliff. Because this franchise has a big, meaty middle finger for those of you who believe in sh like physics. Go take a bite of his cheese, young lady. Just do it. What's the worst that could happen? Lucy encourages Margot to not only approach strange foreign men, but also to eat whatever they have in their hands. Laugh, audio! <laughs> one-eyed bartender temporarily forgets which eye he's lost. And don't try and tell me this is a subtle clue that he's faking the one eye thing, because this movie is anything but subtle. Did you just steal candies? Yes! these village cops mobilize fast. Were they staking that candy truck out? Also, a f***ing candy truck isn't open during the middle of the day. What about the festival that's happening nearby? Are we saying these pigs can catch up to the souped up hot rod? Earlier I thought it was amusing that Evil Brat was out running the cops in his big wheel because that's something an 80s kid show might do. But now I'm thinking this movie believes non-engine vehicles can compete with cars. That was crazy! We are so close to getting busted! But they just went through the wall of the town, right? Those cops were f***ing relentless during this chase, but just gave up when they encountered a hole in the ground. Sure, everyone in this supposedly realistic Southern California city, just ignore the army of cirrhosis pills walking down the sidewalk. Man, f*** this pizza delivery guy and his never-ending stack of pizzas that go past the letterboxing. You're telling me the restaurant allows him to deliver pizzas in a way that will cause lost inventory and 75% of their profits? Car required, asshole! So wait, this poster is advertising a show called Sing, but it's not the movie that came out six months before this one? It's just another thing called Sing! Exclamation point? Originality much movie? Also, if they are related, I want to see a universe where Seth MacFarlane and Trey Parker have to do a scene together, especially after that whole Cartoon Wars thing a few years ago. The Minions were able to walk through the backstage production and onto the stage of a currently filming singing competition, because we've literally run out of situations to put these little f***wads into. Also, characters running through a Hollywood studio find themselves on soundstage during filming and nobody thinks they're intruders until it's way too late and we're a much dumber cliché. This scene is a humorous inside joke, because a pile of pink toilet paper is exactly how this script was provided to the cast. Is it just me, or is there something a bit off about this movie? They introduce a main antagonist like Balthazar, then go to another story entirely with Gru's twin brother, which makes it seem like two different movies were being made at the same time and spliced it together at the last minute. Fritz, my good fellow, could you get me another napkin, please? Of course, Miss Edith. I know this is played for laughs, but why did they pick Fritz to constantly sh** on in this movie? Does he have a dark past that we don't know about? Even though Drew's house is three times as large as Gru's, they still put the girls in the same room together, complete with a dangerous triple bunk and a ridiculous ladder no child should ever climb. It might not be good unicorn finding weather. Oh yeah, let's not forget the sea story in this movie. Agnes' attempt to find a unicorn. I'm beginning to wonder if they're going to fit Sandman and Venom into this thing. Ha! <laughs> huh, it's funny, because it's Gru! Wait, these assholes were prosecuted for walking onto the studio lot? And convicted within hours? God damn, I thought this movie was just going to be silly and annoying like the other two Despicable Me's, but this genuinely sucks. I've never seen a movie this short waste so much time. Also, man, butts sure are funny, aren't they? If you've stocked your movie with stupid little f***ing animated banana tic tacs, just slap a butt on there and instant comedy f***ing gold. F*** you, movie. There was no emotional connection between Gru and the Minions before now, and he certainly was never shown taking any of them fishing. Also, according to this shot, we've got roughly five minutes before the Earth is swallowed by the sun. When the movie told us that Agnes was going to seek out a unicorn in the forest, I thought that meant with adult supervision. Lucy flipped out earlier when they disappeared, but I guess walking alone into a forest that a one-eyed bartender told you a unicorn lives in is perfectly okay. Unicorns, here we come! What's that for? Bait! Duh! No, seriously, how many unnecessary subplots are there in this movie that's mostly about the rivalry between Gru and Brat? 
Is Margo still hanging out with the dude that gave it the cheese? Will Edith continue her torturous pursuit of Fritz? Will the f***ing minions ever do anything entertaining? Okay, this is Brat's lair. Wait, I thought earlier it was a big deal that he escaped because, well, you didn't know where he would go after escaping. But you know where his lair is, and the AVL is a well-funded organization committed to stopping villains, so I don't see the problem. Even if his lair was considered impenetrable, you're about to do this job with two people. It may not look like much, but this place is armed with some of the most high-tech weaponry known to man. How is it that Brat developed all this evil tech by himself? It's not like his character was described as a super genius. He was just a failed child star. And even though he probably had some scratch from Evil Brat, it only lasted less than three seasons, so the fact that he's enormously wealthy is also some bullshit. Hello, my schmoopsie poo. Whoa! Damn, I didn't realize Harvey Weinstein had a son that lived in Fredonia. <coughs> oh, f me hard, oh, f me hard. How stupid is this movie? Wait, is Brat's Lair seriously within easy boating distance of Fredonia? It's styled as a European country, and Gru lives in California, so where the sh are we? Oh, I miss the minions. I don't. Quick! Camouflage mode! How is he able to go into camouflage mode and stay in sticky mode? When we saw Gru going through the options, it seemed pretty clear that you could only pick one mode. If you could do both, then why even bother doing this mission without it? It's a scanning device! Even though the rockets are pointed specifically at Drew, the scanning device has a flair for the dramatic and starts on the other side of the wall. Man, these sticky suits sure are only sticky when the plot demands them to be. Also, Gru made the plan to break into Brat's lair before he even knew the suits existed. So how the hell did he think he would get in? This plan is highly dependent on these suits. Well, it looks like someone's been reading the Kama Grutra. And finally got to the section on Grusta Nining. Balthazar's lair is impenetrable, except if you want to burn a hole around an AC unit. Wow, the minions are f***ing committed to this escape plan, considering this little guy is being actively sh** on. What kind of air conditioning unit has a panel connected to a carpeted floor? Drew and Gru just happen to be here at the exact time Brat set his alarm to put his evil plan into action. Also, this could have been a good time to turn on that camouflage feature these suits have. <laughs> Getting shot in the eye with this laser causes tinnitus, because the writers have clearly lost control of their senses. Go get him, Brad Pack! Not only did Brad have all these dolls programmed to kill, he had them all in boxes, able to be synchronized to voice commands. Keep in mind that this technological genius still watches VHS tapes. <laughs> Lucy X Machina! But how did she know they were here? And what did she think she was going to do in this helicopter? Didn't Gru tell her that this lair was impenetrable and had a defense system that would shoot missiles at anyone who got close? Look, we got the diamond! And we're going to take it to the AVL and get our jobs back! Yeah, but Gru already had the diamond after the last encounter with Brat. It was the fact that he couldn't catch him that got him fired. So this plan was faulty from the start. Minions singing 99 bottles of beer on the wall is a new chalkboard scratching standard for the Despicable Me franchise. I hate you f***ers so much. What kind of plane has a chain lock? Now that's what I call acting! Even if I believe Balthazar could disguise himself exactly like Lucy, I can never believe he imitated her voice so perfectly. Also, this reveal is one of the most brain-twisting logic problems we've ever encountered in a movie. How did he even get here, especially this fast? I guess he could have been disguised as Lucy here, when Lucy saved them from the spikes, but I'd ask why bother? And if he used a helicopter from his own lair, there should have been another helicopter waiting at Drew's mansion when they landed. Because the idea that he could have flown to Drew, stole his helicopter, and back to his own lair in time is monumentally silly. Especially since he didn't know Drew existed five minutes ago. The plane they're currently in is the same plane Gru and his family arrived on. So he didn't use that to get here. So what the f***ing f movie? Brat! He took the girls! I mean, even more bullshit, right? I guess if Balthazar snuck in, overpowered Lucy, and stole her identity, she could assume he took the girls. But there's no way of knowing that, since she was tied up in the closet the whole time. What is that? So were the minions flying to Fredonia? But they didn't know that's where Gru and company are. God damn, this movie has no sense of where people and creatures are. Okay, so how the f*** did Gru know where Balthazar went? Remember, Balthazar took off in Drew's plane, then showed up to Hollywood inside a giant evil brat, which means he had to go back to his lair to get that. Then he spent the rest of the time underwater from wherever his lair is to Hollywood, and Gru should have no idea where he was. Also, where the f*** are things in this world? They go from Miami to Fredonia to Hollywood to wherever the f*** they want, like it's a trip to the local grocery store. I seen this episode! He's going to bubblegum the whole city and send it up into space! I saw this episode too. It was called Age of Ultron. People taking selfies in front of really dangerous sh cliche. Wait, I thought this bubblegum sh was sticky, so Lucy should be going absolutely nowhere in this scene. All these missiles make a direct hit on the giant robot, which must have all been set to mildly inconvenience. Brat fell from his perch by the Hollywood sign, so how is he able to continue to laser this circle? He's basically at sea level. Drew! Good guess, but how does Gru know that this was Drew's doing? 
He passed out from the fall before Drew even got close to the robot. When archaeologists dig up the sedimentary layer we're all buried under 10,000 years from now, they're going to find way too many movies from this era that somehow end with a humorous dance fight. Great, I went through this whole movie just to see a villain being carried away by a giant bubble while hanging from his ball sack. I'm back on the job, so no villainy tonight! Movie had time to show us a minion prison montage, but has no time to show us how Gru and Lucy got their jobs back. What is happening? It's coming from outside! But it's not waking anyone else in the neighborhood up. Somebody's got to keep the family tradition alive! <laughs> Drew, an unappealing character from start to finish, is supposed to be the villain in Despicable Me 4. Count me out! Comcast! <laughs> My god, they've been planning this from the beginning! Are they gonna keep doing this with creatures based on the names here and the Illumination title? Ill Lint Lion. Now I feel like I'm playing one of those annoying app games that force me to find words and devour my soul with ads. You also subscribe to Commercial Sense. Click the bell, like this video. It's very hard for me to take this movie seriously when it's trying to show me an AVL agent wanting to catch Bell while wielding finger guns. Especially when, by the end of the movie, the anti-villain league will have cool laser blasters. Now all I care about is how this organization went from finger pistols and flashlights to space weapons. Guess who stole the map? Oh no, not the map! Wait, why do we care about that? Oh right, we don't. Well, maybe after these freeze frame introductions that give us absolutely no backstory about any of these characters, they'll explain it. I'm sure it's important and it won't just be a MacGuffin that leads to another MacGuffin. Strong Bad destroys the table to express his excitement that the map has arrived. Does he not have a setting below Table Smash for when he's happy about something? It's almost like he knows his animated character card has appeared on the screen and he must showcase his talents to the unseen audience. Is it so hard to put the map back in your pocket? You know, in case there were more instructions on the back? These statues eject flames that produce enough heat to evaporate the massive waterfall above the flames, but not damage the precious, fragile, elderly human tissue below the flames for reasons. I'm in. But I will leave my jetpack behind like a single-use plastic water bottle, even though the highly expensive piece of equipment would allow me to hover around and avoid pressure-triggered treasure traps. All consequences, physical, emotional, or otherwise, have now been eliminated from the movie. Have all these creatures been standing on the roof for centuries, or whatever, just waiting out weather and boredom for the chance that someday they'd be called upon to fuck up? Step on it, sister! Why the crew wasn't even closer to the temple, we'll never know. Well, I mean, we know it's because it helped the movie build unnecessary tension for WK's escape. But it makes no sense for a team of people attempting to steal a powerful weapon to fuck around. As the elder hero jumps onto a noose, I will point out that these tech-savvy folks know how to create a car that flies and jetpacks and shit. Why they'd ask a person to risk rope burns to be hauled up is beyond me. We're a team! Where's your loyalty? Oh, please. We're villains. <laughs> I can already see the lesson of this movie is something about there being no honor among thieves. Until there is. Wild Knuckles might as well survive this because he didn't die when he hit that rock with his face, so why die now? But the movie still feels the need to tease this as if anything matters. As much as I'm annoyed by Dance Friday Disco instead of Disco Dance Friday, I take more issue with the one-hour parking right in front of the school in the area that should be clearly marked as a fire zone. This teacher writes career day on the board as if the conversation is just starting, but it's 3.09 p.m. and school presumably lets out at 3.15. Only a few kids got to participate. I want to be a teacher! No, you do not. Shitting on a kid's shitty dream. Let's go! Movie whips out a bike like this and expects us to act like Gru isn't the coolest kid in school. Personally, I'd prefer publicly pecking popcorn like playful poultry to be prohibited. I am a big ball wizard! Bragging about your supple wrists. Random red wire and blue wire can be crossed to do some shenanigans cliche. Hello. 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 Bellow all you want, but the minion-sized mole holes are conveniently minion-sized. Man, f*** this ice cream shop where only some of the flavors get the color-coordinated treatment. People who put their food directly onto the table. Cheese Ray! Cheese Ray! What is this Cheese Ray doing aside from just pissing people off? Nothing about the properties of canned cheese product makes me believe these people should be stuck in place like this. Even if it did, he just ate a bunch of it, so his mouth should be all stuck together as well. Everyone is eating their ice cream disrespectfully. What happened to just licking it a little at a time? We have a suckler, a dropper, a long licker, and whatever this alien is doing with his creamed ice that is certainly illegal in public. I don't remember 8-track players or how their cassettes work, but apparently they could be played in a car that wasn't even on. And all music playing technology after 1976 seems really lame by comparison. Drawing a middle seat in a goddamn Corvette when everyone knows there is only room for yourself and one inflamed testicle. Mom? Gru does not understand the concept of knocking, and that is the writer's fault. Writers who clearly don't understand the incredible weight on their shoulders to teach children to knock before opening the door to a rhythmically groaning parent. Gru opens the door and pushes these books aside, but how did he stack these books behind the door after he left? And don't tell me one of the minions did it. Do these f***ers look like they read or stack things neatly? Oh, construction looks great, guys! So tell me again how Oompa Loompas aren't slaves. 
Movie doesn't highlight that this is the most villainous shit Gru does in the entire movie. These highly modern braces on a minion supposedly living in a time where orthodontics dominated enamel to the point of social suffocation. With the power of the Zodiac, we're gonna take out the anti-villain league. But, but what if the most powerful villain group chose not to rent out a studio and record a promotion for their villain's plan? The answer is that everyone would gather in the perfect place at the perfect time anyway, because this movie does whatever it wants, because it assumes that no one will care. Well, I care. Having five arms would really come in handy throughout the rest of this movie, but it never happens again. Also, we never see how Wilde managed to do this trick from the front, and I am thankful and annoyed all at the same time. But first, we gotta get my stone back! No, no, first you gotta explain how anyone got into this room, let alone out of it. Well, here is the door! Animating a child's ass thinking that it is somehow funny for the entertainment of people everywhere. This bathroom is f***ing huge for this tiny house. It's at least the size of the kitchen. And I can't tell if I'm mad that the animators really f*** with interiors not matching exteriors or that my bathroom growing up was about the same square footage as a Yaris. Who are these tiny tater tots? And where did they get so much denim? Great question, but when will someone ask where they also acquired all the double-sided tape to keep the overalls plastered to their shoulders? Yep, because most houses have custom-sized windows with which to let in an incredible amount of minions all at once. I know the minions are supporters of bad guy things, but wasting water is too far. Water is f***ing precious, you tiny yellow pieces of banana split. Well, I was just, uh, trying out this new invention of mine. I call it Sticky Fingers. I suppose that is a better name than the Goopy Grope, which only reminds me to ask why no one is concerned Gru has zero adult supervision. If you ever get famous, remember who gave you your first gadget. Nefario doesn't also tell Gru, remember your success is directly tied to people gifting you things right before you need them, so don't forget to consult regularly with every conveniently placed character on your way, otherwise you're f***ed. Also, Dr. Nefario shows incredible favor to a kid that just walked in off the street. He gives away invention, and here in a moment, he tells Gru how to access the secret lair below. These moments are orchestrated entirely for those of us who know these two wind up meeting each other in the future, but certainly there was a more inventive way to show their initial connection. This just makes it seem like a lonely adult with terrible self-esteem attaches himself to a child that, I would like to reiterate, is without adult supervision. The entrance is ominous and dangerous and cool looking, at least in a 70s TV anchor sort of way. But is it practical? No! And I would argue that for a space regularly housing criminal activity, this setup is alarmingly misplanned. Come back when you've done something to impress me. Okay, fake tension in a movie, I see you. Belle is both open to being impressed later, but right now she is too busy, even though Gru has an appointment to be there. Sure. Behold! The power of flight! Insofar as it serves to be the well-placed distraction needed to keep the plot going. Yeah, yeah, to the left, that's right! People who cannot help saying right instead of correct when giving navigationally related instructions, right? No matter the reason for browsing this store's wares, no matter if the store's wares are even real, this organizational system where rock and roll is in at least two sections is such a dick move. Just keep walking. Why is this man helping this child that he barely knows? Does he not want to keep his job working with the Vicious Six? Gru is being chased by a group of villains so dangerous they have their own video editing department and merchandising wing. I'm really wondering why he's not punching the gas instead of pedaling. I'll distract them. Uh, go, 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 go. In a little bit, Gru will say that he stole the stone, which is actually many stones and a gold pendant, with the intention of impressively returning it. But his life is in danger right now, so if he wants to impress them, why is he needing to distract anyone? Why not stop and face the wacky f***ing nun and say, Belle asked me to impress you all, and I clearly have. Now let's talk about my resume. <laughs> Movie doesn't explain what powers Nunchuck has in general, let alone the one that allows her to survive this. Otto, who was just covered in mud from head to toe, suddenly has nothing on him. It is as if the minions are indestructible seeing chameleons that use Goo Gone as their daily lotion. You're fired! When I get home, you all better be gone! Only one of these little guys really failed, and maybe the disco one was annoying, but that only requires one or two terminations at most, group. Any more than that is just being dramatic for dramatic sake and giving a couple of these assholes a reason to learn kung fu later. Did Wild Knuckles have this obnoxiously large house in the middle of San Francisco the entire time, or did he build it after his near-death experience? Either way, the Vicious Five not being aware of this house, or at least not stopping by to steal his shit, might be the most unbelievable part of this movie. Given the perfect landing here, it's clear that they practiced this maneuver before, and I find it upsetting that they haven't reinforced the railing to be able to withstand disrespect to the wood like this. These henchmen cost a fortune in repairs alone. This minion enters with a bat to kill Otto, just so we remember how many of the characters in this animated movie for kids are willing to resort to murder at the drop of a hat. Also, I've watched a f***ing minion be blowtorched and survive. You think a bat is going to intimidate Otto into remembering? Why would the minions need to draw a picture of a kid that lives in a house they know how to find? 
Automatic garage doors are supposed to be convenient, but this one is so committed to the film that it starts opening as they approach the house and conveniently waits for us to cut back from the minions questioning the kid before it decides to finish opening. You know, so we don't miss anything. The assholes that installed a ceiling fan with actual blades sharp enough to cut hair. Speaking minionese is probably adorable for most people, but all I can think of is if someone had told these minions to shut the f up, it would have saved me 40 minutes of watch time. We're coming for you, Mr. Gru! I would be more worried for Gru and crew if I knew what these vehicles were capable of in the first place, and I should already know, because these assholes should have used these machines the first time they were chasing down their stolen pendant! Also, the Mario Kart vehicle selection screen somehow makes its way into the movie, but refuses to banana when they race. All these flights are going to or coming from cities, except this one that apparently came from the country of Argentina, like it was a subway train making all the local stops, then running express. Por San Pan Pisco. Movie inadvertently pitches the idea of a Peruvian distillery called Saint Bread, without even considering that this would already be the name of a bakery in Seattle. So there I was, lost thrust in both engines, and I had to turn back at LaGuardia. <laughs> this animated personification of an Embry Riddle student's wet dream. Yep, here they go. They're wearing pilot uniforms that were crafted from the fabric of Illumination. Good afternoon, passengers. This is your captain speaking. Due to turbulence, I've turned on the fasten seatbelt light and must regretfully inform you that beverage service will be suspended while the minions attempt to break as many federal laws as they can in the next five minutes because it's fun and they like to party or some shit. And add like 20 more because I'm not an expert and I'm pretty sure we missed a bunch in that sequence. Also, f the 70s for having more legroom on its flights. Sure, they probably didn't have this cartoonish amount of legroom, but I knew it was more than I get now, and I never got to experience it, so there. Also, also, no one is smoking on this 70s flight. It's sort of fun to sit back and realize that we are witnessing the birth of a million children's unfounded fear of airplane toilets. Also, it's not that I want to see butthole, but this is where the butthole should be making this a cat's level butthole erasure. This flight time makes it seem like they took off from Oakland. I know there can be congestion on the Bay Bridge, but goddamn. After all that plain nonsense, the minions are allowed to disembark without being thrown in jail, prosecuted, or shot on sight. I assume the fancy new water pistols the AVL has at the end are the result of funding being siphoned off the budget of the FAA. Your minions better get here by sundown tomorrow, because if 48 hours of disco don't kill you, the blade will. 48 hours from now, it's not going to be tomorrow, it's going to be the day after tomorrow. And it's also going to be the same time that it is now, and according to that window, it is not sundown. Otto is pretty far behind the biker, but not far enough behind to require the little guy to traverse multiple climates to catch up, especially since he appears to be reaching Dom Toretto's speeds during this pursuit. They are all cheering for Otto here, and we love it. But meanwhile, in the background, Evil Knievel died. You know, for the kids. This f***ing rolly yellow blob of insanity should be mangled by this trolley, but magically winds up hanging off the side as if an afterthought on a shopping spree. What am I invested in if not the death of adorable creatures? What am I supposed to care about? Of course the trolley stops directly in front of the one place the minions need to find because nothing in this movie is acquired through work or planning. Everything is handed to them. Okay, sure, you're a muscly badass, but now you've ripped up your punching bag and have to repair or replace it. So where's the fun in that, hmm? These trashed paint cans have enough paint to cover the front of a body and enough variety to allow Stuart to go full PETA into a wall. Let's talk about these goggles. Earlier mud slipped right off, but now paint easily sticks, and to make things even more confusing, the goggles can apparently be removed so that an eyelid can be painted. I thought the goggles were a permanent fixture with the purpose to do something seriously important like keeping their head attached. Now they can just come free for a painting exercise? What are the goggles for? Why are they wearing them? Are they magical? This asshole no longer has paint on his person after leaving the last scene, and I am very upset at the missed opportunity to have Stuart awkwardly painted like this for the remainder of the movie, which may have actually been funny. Kung Fu Grandma Ex Machina. I am a master of the ancient Shaolin art of Kung Fu. Well, that was pretty obvious. You don't have to brag about it. Movie misses the clear opportunity for the person farts in a kid's movie cliche and opts to put it here. Let me fix it. Now you. Yeah! Okay. No kicking. What sort of terrible teacher gives up on training the new students after only one attempt at kicking? Better question, what sort of terrible teacher considers this a basic kick in the first place? Her hip is dislocated and she can count the hairs circling her ankle with a quick eye level glance. This is not basic. Stuart being almost knocked into Looney Tunes gave me a flashback to Space Jam. The bad one. How f***ing dare you, Stuart? There are goddamn children watching. Holy sh**, do they not realize that what children watch they become? Jesus. 
The minions having time for this technically makes sense because nothing they do makes sense, and if nothing you do makes sense, then everything makes sense, I think. That being said, this is still abuse. So long, old man. Guys, come on, we're a team. Where is this f***ing door? Hey, wanna try this on, little dude? After that long chase through the desert with all that set up for Otto's big hero moment, the movie goes with the pendant just lucking its way back into his hands. Oh. It's a lucky day, kid. I'm headed up the coast. These two are later seen driving down the coast. Neither of these two has bugs stuck in their teeth, their hair, or really anywhere on their person. Start with the pool. What f***ing pool? You showed us the backyard ten minutes ago and there was no f***ing pool. Holy sh! why is this movie so dumb? Gotcha! Where are your helpful extra arms now, old man? Hmm, where are they? Uh, no. ah! Being a dick to Redwoods. Also, this kicks off a second training montage where the minions will learn everything they need to know to defeat the Vicious Five without ever learning anything they need to know to defeat the Vicious Five. Because every random person has a massive safe ready to drop from the ceiling, Acme style. They're dead. Unfortunately, they are not. Discount Shape of Water Dude doesn't have a bigger role in this movie. Was the plan for Gru to go up to the safe and just accidental his way into it? He look zooms in on the key in the guard's back pocket, as if it were an afterthought, and acts like the bringing along of the goopy device was just a coincidental bonus. And what if the trash can weren't by the door? Do something! My life is flashing before my eyes! No one in this room, not even the evil tellers that work at an evil bank filled with e-villains that were definitely trained for this sh see the green goo shooting across the room or question the suspiciously dramatic patron who demands someone looky at his boo-boo. Gru took the Mona Lisa from the vault and put it in a tiny backpack. And this is really upsetting, considering they never use their magical bag of holding for any other nefarious purposes for the rest of the movie. Something big's going down in Frisco! Said after seeing just two vehicles with lights and sirens. Sure, San Francisco is a big city, so saying this at any moment is likely to be at least somewhat true, but it doesn't make sense based solely on the evidence at hand. Also, these two see fireworks over the massive city and not only somehow find their way to the source, but also arrive through traffic fast enough for the fireworks to still be popping, and they found a parking spot! Otto walks out in front of the stilt walkers, and none of them instinctively react to the yellow mobile obstruction in the road that could cause them to fall and break their legs. My friend, you're now gonna learn from the old school. Which isn't that impressive when you consider the old school guy didn't notice his house was 99% demolished before arriving at the door. Wild Knuckles is understandably upset with his previous allies for destroying his home, but look at the bright side. Every level of the house came crashing down to ground level. But then they also cleared out the debris piles so that you could still easily walk across the floor. That's real friendship. This article is nothing more than an acid trip rambling about a bluebird caribou. So the sin, as always, is nature. You're just a little kid. It's over. Go home. I think Wild Knuckles forgot that he kidnapped Gru and probably needs to give him a ride back home. Also, despite nothing changing other than his house being demolished by the exact assholes who do this sort of thing, Wild Knuckles gets all sad and pushes Gru away because a third act without contrived tension really isn't a third act at all, I guess. Did you forget what time it is? Okay, neat, it's the new year, but how did Belle know which time zone would kick off the magic? Also, how does this pendant know which people to transform? There are 12 Zodiacs, but only the five very specific plot-centered villains transform. Somehow, someone managed to tie tiny knots with their big old monster paw claws, and I call it bulls Enjoy being torn apart! Choosing this slow-ass murder method instead of using your dragon form to immediately light him on fire. Why don't we make this a fair fight? But why? She's an evil person that wants to slowly tear a child to pieces for stealing an artifact meant to impress her because she asked to be impressed. This is not the sort of character that would give away Zodiac powers to an enemy. Oh, you thought I was serious? You were serious. You did turn them into something else. What is highly confusing is how she has the power to give them just enough power to make them only slightly less intimidating than a cheap toy at a Zodiac tourist shop. You can destroy everything I own, but I will not let you hurt that kid! Which is why I strolled over here as if arriving 10 minutes early for my colonoscopy appointment so I could complete paperwork and read up on the long-term side effects of Miralax. No! No, me. Okay, this army. This army is not immediately eaten by this army. That is not how eggs work. At least I hope not. This is also not how eggs work. Stewart has only been a chicken for a few minutes. That is not nearly enough time for this chick to be full term. Unless Stewart was pregnant the entire time, in which case the sin is Master Chow kicking them in the face earlier. This disappointing moment when the minions seem to revert back to having no useful powers whatsoever. It's like after the performance enhancer wears down and your partner gives you that look that says, oh, it's you again. When is the other you coming back? Zodiac Stone is just point and click, huh? 
No training, no spells, nothing. The little guy stays a baby chicken minion, even after they all transform back into normal minions. And the movie just wants us to assume this is because life finds a way. Touching someone's waddle without explicit consent. Don't worry about me, kid. If a human could live through a direct dragon fireball to the face, I don't think Gru should be concerned about anything. This asshole shows up to his own fake funeral wearing his signature clothing and thinks ducking behind a tree is going to help. I'm going to be the best villain ever because of you. Movie reminds us that this is the quasi-origin story of a bad guy and makes us question whether or not we should have been rooting for his success during any point in the movie. Find your tribe and never, ever let them go. If Gru really had internalized this lesson at this stage in his life, then why was the whole first movie about him learning to embrace the orphan children? All of this happens within 20 feet of the grave, which is surrounded by people, and no one notices the body desecration happening. Well, there's no actual body to desecrate, but they wouldn't know that. All right, all right, fine. Stop with the face. I'm in. Without asking how a child is going to pay your wages. In the past few minutes, we've seen Kid Gru with two elderly villains without anyone wondering where Gru's parent is. Where is his f***ing mother? Want to say something cool? So Gru was just gifted his Millennium Falcon? I was hoping he would have at least won it in a card game or some shit. Earlier, we were asked to believe that people went down an elevator to the secret lair. Where would that elevator shaft be if the entirety of the area below the shop is dedicated as a hangar for an airship? Big bus, big bus! Big boss! I like that! But how would Gru be considered the big boss at all? He stole a pendant using someone else's technology. He stole a painting using someone else's technology. He had to be rescued by other people throughout the movie and is currently leaving the city in a ship designed by someone else. He has never been the mastermind and arguably the only big boss thing he ever did was jump into a pool of angry crocodiles to rip his hero free. And that was a fever dream because there was never a goddamn pool in the backyard to begin with. Babysitter. And we are introducing a product today that takes us exactly there, and that product is called iPod. We've been working on this for a while. It's busy lifting drinks. They fill you with gas, and the gas is so terrifically lifting that it lifts you right off the ground like a balloon. And the butt for? What's a butt for? For pooping, silly. We sold 43 mini mints, 30 taco swirlies, and 18 coconutties. You say that like it's a great sale day. Look. Is Wayne Brady gonna have to choke a bitch? It has been disintegrated. And brother, when it disintegrates, it disintegrates. <laughs> you mean shrink it. Significant shrinkage. No! In the face! In the face! No! That kid is back on the escalator again. Leave it alone. What? The flowers are still standing. Lucy, these are my girls. I suffer from voice immodulation. I'm unable to control the pitch or volume of my voice. Want to hear the most annoying sound in the world? I really need you to make a choice, hon. Welcome to Germany. On futile then, asshole. Uh. <laughs> Thousand straight. Very aggressive. Uh, uh. Pants and burgers. Yeah, lots of space in this mall. I have been stabbed, shot, poisoned, frozen, hung, electrocuted, and burned. Bob, come on, Bob. Bob, rise and shine. Check, check, check one, one. syphilis. Ouch, town population, you, bro. No, God, please, no! Evil. Like it's the fruits of the devil. Welcome to the Himalayas! Oh, where do go, guys? We killed the original! I'm Mr. Meeseeks! Look at me! It was me. Her. The whole time. The whole time? The whole time? You were... The whole time? Hey, look! Buildings! That building's so close, I could almost touch it. Would you like some of my cheese? It's like you're dreaming about gorgonzola cheese when it's clearly brie time. I present you with big to confirm my engagement to your daughter. With all respect. Arresting me for what? I'm not allowed to stand up for myself? I thought this was America. You got fired? No! 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 That guy in a little coat. That guy in a little coat. Don't. <laughs> Brick killed a guy. Damn, that is a sweet perk, you might say. 
So, yeah, can I... Um... Can I watch you guys kissing? Well, hello, beautiful. Marion, don't look at it. Shut your eyes, Marion. Don't look at it, no matter what happens. The Vicious Six will be the most powerful villains on the planet. Can you dig it? No, man, but you gotta keep going. What am I gonna do, quit? That's not an option. You gotta keep on keeping on. Life's a garden, dig it. You make it work for you. You never give up, man. That's my philosophy. No, why? They call him Shadow. Because he had a light touch. You're in luck. I have a first pressing. Good evening, Mr. Hunt. The weapons you recovered in Belarus were confirmed to be VX nerve gas, capable of devastating a major city. How did you do that? I used to decorate the cakes down at the bakery. Many fighters have asked me. Why are you wearing glasses? Where's Bill? Look at him! 